Jesus says to his apostles in the first reading of the Acts of the Apostles, he says, the Father is established by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. At first when I read this, I was reminded of a time when I was in choir in high school. We had this gospel spiritual that we sang, and it was, who will be a witness for my Lord? And it goes through all the different biblical figures, you know, Samson will be a witness for my Lord, you know, um, Daniel will be a witness for my Lord, and it goes on. And it, of course, we can insert our own names, we pray one day, is that we have been a witness for our Lord. And what does it mean, of course, too? What are we witnesses to? What have we seen? What have we experienced? You have to be, you know, somebody experienced with some sort of thing to be a witness of it. So what is it? Well, let's look here. We've been going through the Acts of the Apostles for quite a while here for the Easter season. And what is the Acts of the Apostles in general? Well, it's volume two written by St. Luke. St. Luke's first volume, though, was the Gospel of Luke, which told the story of the life of Jesus on earth. Volume 2, he goes on to tell the story of the Catholic Church, the beginnings of her. And this is the second volume of a story that has no end. The Gospel is only the story of what Jesus began to do and to teach. For today he is still alive, for you and I who believe and are his witnesses. And in that last meeting with his apostles, in our Gospel from St. Matthew, he does three things. He first assures them of his power. Secondly, he gave them a mission, and this is called the Great Commission. And three, he promises them his presence. So he assures them of his power, of, of his power to be given to them, and again, they are then bearers of that power. Surely nothing was outside the power of him who had died and conquered death, and they followed someone now who, <laughs> whose authority on heaven and on earth is beyond question. And then they're sent on this mission. And that is kind of a daunting one, too. It's go out to all, make disciples of all the nations. So he sent them all over to win the hearts of people and to remind them that he had died for them. And then he promised them a presence. They're given this staggering thing, really. Eleven humble fellows from Galilee are given and sent forth to conquest the entire world with the gospel message. And even as they heard it, their hearts must have failed them for a moment. <laughs> like, you, all the nations, not just the ones surrounding us, maybe, all of them? But then, no sooner was, God, was Jesus' command given, than the promise followed. He said, then, of course, that I will be with you always. Behold, hold in your being that I will be with you always. And they had the greatest task in all of history, and at the same time, they are given the greatest presence in the world to help them accomplish this. And then the, the text says, when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him from their sight. So why a cloud? <laughs> why a cloud? It, it witnesses to the fact that he was being lifted up, of course, and into the mystery of God, where he lives to intercede for us. And this should also call to mind the fact that we use incense in the liturgy. And when we use incense, this should evoke memories brought to the present while elsewhere, when elsewhere in Scripture, a cloud has been significant of God's presence. For one, the transfiguration. And secondly, also, when Mary's fiat to the angel who speaks of her being overshadowed by the power of the Most High. The holy tent in the Old Covenant, too, had a pillar of cloud that represented the Lord's presence with them. And it's interesting to note in passing, too, the two men dressed in white who appeared there should prompt in us, too, why are these two appearing in white? Who are they? What does it mean? And the Ark of the Covenant, look back to the Old Testament. At the Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels, always in attendance, the cherubim, always there in attendance to the mystery of God. Also, the tomb of Christ. Two men dressed in white appear there, as the tomb was the place where Christ, our Paschal victim, was bound and sacrificed to the Father in atonement for our sins. And 
In Luke's account of this great commission, he says that they left that scene with great joy. So they were joyful witnesses. So that's interesting too. They're given this great task and then Jesus ascends into heaven. But they're joyful. So something happened that it wasn't just like, oh, he's gone now. It wasn't just that. And Benedict XVI says of this, he says, they do not consider Jesus to have disappeared far away into an inaccessible heaven. They are obviously convinced of a new presence of Jesus. They are to certain that he is now present to them in a new and powerful way. So then ascension, the solemnity we celebrate today, ascension means the continuing closeness that the disciples experience so strongly that it becomes a source of lasting joy. Because Jesus is with the Father at his right hand, he remains close to us. And when we think of the ascension, it should bring to mind the reality of this presence of Jesus. And there is a story in the life of Jesus that helps us understand this more clearly. He clearly had this in his life in order to help his disciples understand the ascension one day. And it's in Mark 6, and this is the story. It's after the multiplication of the loaves. After that scene, the Lord makes the disciples get into a boat and go across to Bethsaida, to the opposite shore, and he himself dismisses the crowd and goes up on the mountain to pray. So he's not with his disciples. So the disciples are alone in the boat, and as they're crossing, a great headwind and a turbulent sea results, and all of this happens. They are threatened by the power of the waves and the storm that they are in. And the Lord seems far away on his mountain in prayer. But because Jesus is with the Father in prayer, he sees them. And because he sees them, he comes to them across the water. And he gets into the boat with them and makes it possible for them to continue to their destination. And so <laughs> Jesus is with the Father. And so he sees you and me. He knows what we are going through, especially when there are storms. But he calls us to be witnesses. You will be my witnesses. We should envision ourselves in that crowd where Jesus is then speaking to his apostles and saying, you will be my witnesses now in Chisholm, in Buell, and in the surrounding areas, and all of this region in northeastern Minnesota, and then wherever else you go to the ends of the earth, which you can go now because there's lots of jets and all of that. I'm sure he would have said that and qualified maybe. But that's also true for you and me. And a witness, what is a witness then? A real witness is a person who says, I know this is true. Not I think so. I think this is true. I mean, think in a courtroom, how convincing that witness would be when they say, is this the man you saw on the night of November the 12th? And you're like, well, I think so. I think so. I think that was him. He had black hair, I guess. No, that's not going to convince any jury worth their salt. It's going to be like, no, I know this is true. And for you and me, too, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, we have to know that he came, he died, and rose again and ascended into heaven, and also that we have met him and encountered him in his word. And every time we have sensed love, we have known his presence. And every time in the Mass we hear his words, but also receive him in the Eucharist, we know that is him. And when we say amen, we know that we are receiving the most holy presence that we can ever encounter. So a real witness is one who says, I know this is true. Christianity is animated by this. Real witness then is also not somebody just of words, a bunch of sweet words, big deal. It's somebody who does the will of his heavenly father. It's somebody who does with his deeds the things that Jesus calls him to do in those moments. It's a witness of a life lived in holiness then becomes an irresistible case for people to encounter. And we're striving for this. This is why we hold our hands out for grace each week in the Mass. Lord, grant me greater grace to be the saint you call me to be. And the Greek word for witness is the same exact word for martyr. So, martus. A witness is one who has to be ready to be a martyr, loyalty no matter what the cost. So let us be a witness for our Lord.